Today, we're going to answer questions about multiple sclerosis from Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit. Let's have some fun. Moms for the People's House asked me to talk about black hole lesions on MRI scans. So in MS, a black hole refers to a lesion that is dark or black on T1 sequences of the MRI scans. So usually MS lesions are easiest to see on T2 sequences of the MRI where they look bright. And sometimes the lesions can be bright on T2 but normal on T1. And based on autopsy and biopsy studies, this has been found to correlate with so-called shadow plaques, which are areas where there's demyelination, but also a lot of remyelination. And a lot of people with MS have many T2 bright lesions, but relatively minimal symptoms, and that's probably due to extensive remyelination. With black holes, that's been associated with more permanent injury to the underlying axons or nerve fibers, and generally speaking, black holes are associated with greater disability, although most people with MS have at least some black holes. VH asks, if you have MS, and optic neuritis, is it okay to have surgical procedures on the lens of the eye, such as Lasix? And the answer is yes. I'm not aware of any reason why this would be contraindicated, though there's nothing really in the medical literature. However, it should be noted that Lasix really only corrects refractive vision loss, in other words, inability to bend the light correctly due to the lens. It doesn't fix optic nerve damage from optic neuritis. Eating Lemons asks, are there predictors of future progression or future disability in MS? And the answer is yes. There's a lot of research on this topic and the following factors have been associated with the worst prognosis in MS on average. One is having severe attacks with poor recovery, particularly if they cause weakness or motor symptoms or bladder symptoms. Also if there's a short time between the first and second attack. Also if there are a lot of lesions in the spine with spinal cord atrophy. Also people who have progressive MS tend to do worse than people with relapsing MS. And people who have a moderate amount of disability, like an EDSS of three or four earlier in the disease, are more likely to have significant disability such as EDSS. SS 6 to 6.5 later in the disease. This is a formal study on prognosis in MS, and you can see the green squares represent the six-year follow-up, and the red circles represent a 12-year follow-up, and more to the right on this chart means a greater risk of more disability. And they found people who were older had a greater chance of more disability, but this was mostly because they had a greater chance of having progressive MS. You can see that people with primary progressive MS tended to do worse than those with relapsing MS, and people who had a higher EDS in other words, more disability at baseline did worse, and those with more worsening of their disability early on tended to do worse. And there's a trend towards those who have more T1 dark lesions or black holes that I mentioned earlier tend to do worse, although a lot of factors such as gender weren't really strongly associated with disability over the long run. Faye asks, what are the best treatments for MS fatigue? Even though it's invisible, many people with MS report fatigue as their most severe and disabling symptom. Now, this is a very complicated symptom. Symptom. I'll often recommend people have other tests just to make sure something else isn't contributing to their fatigue, to make sure they don't have anemia, hypothyroidism, B12 deficiency, carnitine deficiency. If people have symptoms suggestive of a sleep disorder like sleep apnea or narcolepsy, I may recommend a formal sleep study. In terms of the other treatments, there's some evidence that diet may play a role in the treatment of MS fatigue. One study suggests that the Terry Walls diet, a paleo diet, may be helpful in treating MS fatigue. Fatigue, and another study done at Oregon Health Sciences University suggests that a whole foods plant-based diet may also help with MS fatigue. Some of the other treatments include B12 shots, and for severe fatigue, stimulants can be helpful, such as Ritalin, Adderall, or Provigil, although these medications can cause tolerance and other side effects. John Wolf asks, can I have MS without the sign in the spinal fluid? So John is referring to a sign seen in 90% of people with multiple sclerosis, which which is that in the spinal fluid, we often find abnormal antibodies that target central nervous system antigens. And the way we do this test is we take the spinal fluid and we put it on a gel and do what's called electrophoresis, and it shows up as dark bands, and hence this finding is known as oligoclonal bands. But as I said, it's only in about 90% of people with MS, so it's definitely possible to still have MS, even if the spinal tap is normal. But if I had a patient with a normal spinal tap, I would regard this as a red flag and I would review the history and MRI very carefully to make sure the diagnosis is actually MS. Dr. Gorov asks, I had optic neuritis, but I had a normal MRI of the brain. Do I still have to worry about MS? 
Well, there are many causes of optic neuritis, and I can't comment on your specific situation, but the good news is there was a famous study called the Optic Neuritis Treatment Trial published in 1999, and they found that after optic neuritis, if you had a completely normal MRI of the brain, in other words, with no lesions suspicious for multiple sclerosis, the risk of developing MS was pretty low, only about 15%, and now with modern MRIs that are even better at detecting smaller lesions, the risk may be even lower. Espio Kajta asks, how common is it to get new lesions while taking Ocrevus? This is data from the five-year extension study of the OPERA trial, a randomized trial of Ocrevus versus Rebif in relapsing MS, and we're looking at gadolinium-enhancing lesions on top and newer enlarging T2 lesions on the bottom, and just focus on the blue bars because those are the people who got Ocrevus the whole time. And you can see early on through week 24, it's not uncommon for people taking Ocrevus to get enhancing or especially new T2 lesions. However, However, as you go on, it becomes quite uncommon. You can see 0.006 average number of enhancing lesions per scan. So there's somewhat of a therapeutic lag, but for someone who's been on Ocrevus for a while, new lesions are pretty rare. Ichabod13 asks about the gray matter lesions in MS. So in the brain, we have gray matter and white matter. The gray matter is where the cells are, the neurons and other neural cells. The white matter is where the nerve fibers are, or the axons, and they're coated with the fatty sheet myelin, which is fatty and hence white on anatomical sections. Now in conventional MRI, we can really only see the white matter lesions, but with 7 Tesla MRI and based on autopsy studies, we know that MS also affects the gray matter, and in fact there are various types of gray matter lesions in MS, the most common being leukocortical lesions, lesions that bridge the gray and white matter, and gray matter disease may have very significant effects on certain types of symptoms in MS, such as cognitive symptoms and fatigue. Now as to why one radiologist pointed out gray matter lesions but the other didn't, that may be just due to the individual preferences of the radiologist rather than a true change in the scan. BW asks, what role does diet play in MS? Well, I suspect it plays a significant role based on the increasing prevalence of MS and the relatively low prevalence in certain areas of the world. There's epidemiologic evidence that areas with higher dairy consumption have more MS. The same is true for saturated fat consumption. Salt has also been linked to MS, sodium consumption. However, there's no single proven diet for MS. I'm partial to advice given by Professor George Jelinek in the book Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis, which recommends a whole foods, plant-based diet plus seafood. But many people have reported good results with other diets. Unfortunately, we don't have any definitive evidence to recommend a specific diet. Tom asks, when should someone consider changing therapy? Well, there are many reasons, of course. One would be having side effects from the medication. Another would be fear of side effects. For instance, if you're taking Tysabri and you're now JC virus antibody positive with a high index level and hence have a high risk of PML, you may consider changing medications. Of course, the most important reason is that it's not working. And generally speaking, the goal in MS is to have no evidence of disease activity. In other words, no new lesions on the MRI, no relapses, and no progression of disability. Of course, there are many other factors to consider. Those are just the main reasons for changing medication. A related question comes from Adam, who asks, at what stage should people consider stem cell treatments? Now, I'm assuming that Adam is referring to hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and I have a separate video on that topic. But basically, to review, this is a treatment where powerful chemotherapy is given to wipe out the immune system, and your own hematopoietic cells are given back to you to regenerate your immune system. And many people with relapsing MS have a good response to this treatment, and sometimes they have long-term remission. However, it does have significant risk, depending on the specific age agents used, such as weakening of the immune system, infections, anemia, and infertility. Hence, me personally, I probably wouldn't recommend it to many people unless they had real evidence of clear inflammatory disease despite taking a high-efficacy disease-modifying therapy. There's evidence that this treatment works best in younger people with relapsing MS, and there really isn't great evidence for it in progressive MS. Tina asks, are there any therapies to restore myelin or function? Well, right now, we don't have any approved therapies therapy that remyelinates the central nervous system, although this is being studied, one interesting candidate is clomastine, an old antihistamine that has evidence for remyelination in rats, and is being studied in humans in a study called the RECOVER trial at University of California, San Francisco, to be completed in 2022. In terms of restoring function, there are some treatments for this. One example is Ampira, or Dalfampridine, a medication which helps improves walking speed in some people with MS. 
Rocky Raccoon asks, which non-FDA approved treatment do you think is most promising? And I would have to answer the class of drugs, which is the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as mesitinib, because these drugs have interesting effects on the innate immune response, such as microglia, which seem to be involved in slow, smoldering inflammation, as Professor Giovannoni would say, in progressive multiple sclerosis. And I think there's a good chance we could see an FDA approved drug in this class within the next few years years. So thank you to everyone who submitted a question. And if you have additional questions, please post in the comments below. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. There were just too many. And I definitely want to do a future video like this. And let me know if you have any other suggestions for videos.